Welcome. It's a great pleasure. On behalf of the UC Humanities Research Institute and the Townsend Center, to welcome you to a forum put together by David Theo Goldberg and myself, Wendy Brown, called The University We Are For. This is the second. I see what you mean about the garbling. OK. Yeah? OK. This is the second in a series of uh, universities we are for forums uh, that David has organized, and there may be more. So um, they're kind of campus to campus. The first was at Irvine, is that correct? And David suggested that we do one in the north, so here we are. Uh, I'm just going to say a very brief word about what we have in mind, and then I'll introduce the participants. And they will each speak for about 10 minutes, and then we will have a discussion about the university we are for. Uh, for a group in Berkeley, we don't need to rehearse how much is being taken away from us these days, or how much feels that it's being put on the corporate auction block. Uh, not only programs and staff, uh, but classrooms, possibly, uh, professors, students, access that doesn't involve debt p and for life, and much more. So our strongest inclination often these days, I think, is to just hang on desperately to our piece of the rock, whatever that piece of the rock is, or to move to a more general defense of what was so precious in the near and far past of the university, or to just cry out on behalf of what we have loved and valued in university life, but now fear is going to be extinguished, possibly permanently, in the conjuncture between fiscal crisis on the one hand and the extraordinary opportunism of neoliberalism on the other. So these inclinations usually amount to, quite understandably, protest against change protest against destruction or elimination or transformation of the university. And, and these are the inclinations that this forum is not itself objecting to, but asking us to bracket. And to bracket in favor of thinking hard for a couple of hours about what university we are for. Now, we obviously can't do this in toto. We'll do little pieces. We'll talk about little things that we want to be present in the university. Um, and as we do this, of course, it doesn't mean we won't draw from the past in envisioning the future. It doesn't mean we won't reckon with some of the miserable constraints facing us now, or that we won't reckon with some of the current forces that bear down on what we are and what we do. But what the participants have in, been invited to ruminate on for um, just a little bit of time is the question of what ought to be governing our future, the future that we're fighting for in this particular life form, the university. So that's, that's our project. Now let me tell you who is before us. I'm going to introduce them um, in, in the order in which you find them at the table, I think. Uh, and, um, and then they're going to speak in an entirely different order, just to keep you awake. So way down at the end is Catherine Stimson who is university professor and former dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at New York University. She has lectured widely, to put it mildly, in the US and abroad. She's also served as chair of the New York State Council for the Humanities, the National Council for Research on Women, the Miss Magazine Board of Scholars. She's former president of the Modern Languages Association and currently serves on the board of a number of, of, of educational and cultural organizations. She's also chair of the National Advisory Committee of the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation and president of the Association of Graduate Schools. Now, each of the people I introduce, also needless to say, has a huge long list of other things that hang off of them on their CVs and so forth, but I'm trying to give you a sense of really why they're here. Um, thinking with us about what, what the university is for. OK, who's next? That would be James, excuse me, Jim Clifford, who is Professor Emeritus, it's an odd word to say to him, of History of Consciousness at UC Santa Cruz. Jim is a prolific author, a beautiful writer. He's best known for his pathbreaking critiques of anthropological and historical practice, and especially for his early, powerful accounts of colonial and post-colonial discourse. 
His recent work concerns local cultural processes in relation to national and international pressures. He's pursuing research on museums, festivals, and most generally, the performance of traditional identities in contexts of regionalization, ethnic resurgence, and touristic co commodification. Who's after that? Okay, that would be. Is that, is that what, you know, what's ironic, of course, is this not only came off your website, but then went through several mediations before it came to me. So I didn't even know what I was reading, except I realized that last part didn't sound right. It wasn't you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's see if we can do better with um, Stanley Katz, who is next. <laughs> uh, he is professor of public and international affairs at Princeton University. I hope that's true. He's a leading expert on American legal and constitutional history, on philanthropy and nonprofit institutions. He's the author and editor of numerous books and articles. He's also former president of the American Council of Learned Societies, the ACLS, former president of the Organization of American Historians, former president of the American Society for Legal History. He's on the board of trustees of the Newberry Library, the Social Science Research Council, and the Copyright Clearance Center. His current research focuses on the relationship of civil society and constitutionalism to democracy, and on the relationship of the US to international human rights regimes. And then, sitting um, to the right is um, Frank Donahue, who is Associate Professor of English at Ohio State University. He is the author of my favorite book from the summer, uh, my summer reading, I read it two years late, called The Last Professors, the corporate, sorry? You said, wow, The Last Professors. <laughs> yes, that's us. <laughs> the Last Professors, the Corporate University, and the Fate of the Humanities. It examines the link between the adoption of corporate values and the decline of the liberal arts and the professoriate. He's also author of The Fame Machine, book reviewing and 18th century literary careers. Among his provocative lectures and publications are Why Academic Freedom Doesn't Matter, and my favorite, which I think I'm remembering correctly, Don't Publish. Is that right? Um, and Belinda Tucker, sitting to his right, is a social psychologist and professor of department and of psychiatry and behavioral sciences in the David Geffen School of Medicine. She is also faculty associate in the Bunch Center for African American Studies, all of this at UCLA, and she holds an appointment in the Center for Culture and Health in the Jane and Terry Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. She's got a lot of feet in a lot of different ponds. Tucker directs the Family Research Consortium for an interest, mm -mm, a national network of family mental health scholars. Her primary research interest concerns the changing social and psychological character and functions of family in North American society and how these vary across cultural differences. Last but hardly least, William Ferris is former chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities and professor of history at UNC Chapel Hill. He's associate director of the Center for the Study of the American South. He's widely recognized as a leader in Southern studies, African American music, and folklore. He's the author of many books. He's also a prolific documentary filmmaker. Most of his work deals with African American music and other folklore of the Mississippi Delta. He co-edited the Pulitzer Prize nominee Encyclopedia of Southern Culture, which is widely recognized as a major reference work linking popular folk and academic cultures. So those are the six people who will be giving you their first thoughts on, or some thoughts on what university we are for. And we are starting with Stanley Katz, and you're welcome to come up here if you like, or to stay where you are. It's really up to you. you you just switched the signals. Oh, did I? Yeah. Did I tell you, you something completely you said different? I was fourth, but I'm happy to go first. <laughs> Hold on a second. I, you know what? You are absolutely right. I, I switched my own pages. You are absolutely right. Stay there. Relax. The first, shall be fourth. first is William Ferris. Thank you. First shall be fourth in our university. Thank you, Wendy. It's a great honor to be at this conference on the university we are for sponsored by the University of California Humanities Research Institute and organized by Wendy Brown and David Goldberg 
And what better place to hold this conversation than the Doreen B. Townsend Center for the Humanities here at the University of California, Berkeley. Recalling William Faulkner's remark that in the South, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Uh, in considering the future of the university and the university we are for, we should frame our discussion with the history of education and of the university in America. Thomas Jefferson believed strongly that education was the key to democracy. He argued that if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. America's universities are the repositories of our nation's intellectual capital. They are the primary focus of what my friends at the National Endowment for the Humanities call the Humanities Pipeline, where scholars develop research, then publish their work in books that will in time be used in classrooms, museums, and films. It is a sacred process that American universities nurture just as they nurture their faculty and students. A new book recently published at the, by the University of North Carolina Chancellor Holden Thorpe and Buck Goldstein, professor of economics at UNC, is entitled Engines of Innovation, the Entrepreneurial University in the 21st Century. The book is a response to the fall of 2008, when the greatest financial crisis since the Great Depression wiped out trillions of dollars of wealth in a few weeks. Thorpe and Goldstein quote Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, who said, we are going to have to innovate our way out of this thing and our great research universities will have to lead the way. At UNC, Thorpe and Goldstein point to the humanities and the work of Ruel Tyson, a philosopher theologian who founded the UNC Institute for the Arts and Humanities in 1968. Since that time, the Institute has raised $50 million and worked with over 450 faculty in its programs. The American University is an institution whose goal is to open windows and doors, not to build walls. An institution that embraces the full spectrum of the folk popular and academic culture in which we live. This vision is not new. In his preface to the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Mark Twain explains how he uses Missouri Negro dialect, the Southern Western dialect, and the ordinary Pike County dialect, so the reader will not assume that his characters are trying to speak alike and not succeeding. Twain warns that any reader who attempts to find a motive in the book will be prosecuted. To find a moral in it will be banished. To find a plot in it will be shot by order of the author. Berkeley resident Alice Walker is equally adept at weaving the blues, the sermon, the folk voice into her classic, The Color Purple. America's great writers demonstrate the vitality, the power generated when the voices of written and oral traditions are joined. American universities have long been home for our nation's social movements. From his alma mater at the University of North Carolina 
to his position as Dean of Stern Hall as, at Stanford University and at campuses across the nation, Allard Lowenstein built student support for the civil rights movement. At Harvard University, Bob Moses shaped similar support for the movement that led to the Mississippi Freedom Summer. Lowenstein and Moses mobilized support at universities to realize Martin Luther King's dream that we let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California, from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, so that all of God's children will finally be able to sing, free at last, free at last, Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Like the early Spanish missions, California's great universities spread like a string of pearls throughout the state at Davis, Irvine, Los Angeles, Merced, Riverside, La Jolla, San Francisco, Santa Barbara, Santa Cruz, and at your crown jewel here in Berkeley. With the smell of eucalyptus in the air, we are reminded that no greater example exists to demonstrate the intellectual and cultural capital universities bring to our nation than the University of California at Berkeley. When I served as chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, it was my honor to work with Berkeley faculty, Arthur Blaustein and Charles Henry, who served on NEH's National Council. And I'm honored that Charles is with us today. Berkeley faculty have received 25 Nobel Prizes and 45 MacArthur Fellowships. Distinguished Berkeley faculty, Alan Dundas, Larry Levine, and Leon Litvak transformed our understanding of American folklore, history, and music as they challenged their colleagues and students to reach beyond the traditional borders of disciplines and engage new ideas with vision and courage. Berkeley nurtured student movements in the 60s and 70s that brought important social change to our nation. The free speech, black power, united farm workers, American Indian, and women's movements challenged students at universities throughout America to address injustice. The H.K. Ewan Social Movement Archives in Berkeley's Bancroft Library contains a priceless collection of papers, books, photos, and over 30,000 hours of recordings on the movement. The Bancroft Library is also the home of the Mark Twain papers that chronicle Twain's life and writings. Berkeley also nurtures local institutions beyond its campus, such as Black Oak Bookstore, Shea Panisse Restaurant, Arhuli Records, and Flower Films. Their books, food, music, and films deepen our relationship to these worlds. The legacy of Alfred Krober and Ishii is alive and well at the Townsend Center for the Humanities, where cross-disciplinary threads connect courses and over 60 working groups on topics that range from hip hop to Orientalism. A critical role of the American University is to teach us about history and the power of the places in which we live. For region inspires and grounds the American experience. Whether we are drawn to them or flee from them, the places in which we live etch themselves into our memory in powerful, enduring ways. 
For over three centuries, Americans have crafted a collective memory of places that constitute our nation's distinctive regions. Regions are embedded in every aspect of American history and culture. American places inspired poets and writers from Walt Whitman and Henry David Thoreau to Mark Twain and William Faulkner. These writers grounded their work in the places where they lived. When asked why he never traveled, Thoreau replied, I've traveled widely in Concord. William Faulkner remarked that early in his career as a writer, he realized that he could devote a lifetime to writing and never fully exhaust his little postage stamp of native soil. In each region, American writers frame their work with what Eudora Welty calls sense of place. Through their writing, we encounter the diverse, richly detailed regions of our nation. The sheer size of our nation makes it difficult to imagine its diverse worlds as a single country with a shared culture. Our landscapes, our speech patterns, our foodways all change sharply from region to region. The synergy of different regional worlds bound together within a single nation is what defines the American character. These diverse worlds coexist with the knowledge that America will always be defined by its distinctly different places. As we understand the places that nurture us, we build a stronger foundation for our life. When speaking of how she raised her children, my mother often uses the phrase, give them their roots and they will find their wings. Alice Walker visited the farm where I grew up in rural Mississippi, and thank you, and was inspired by a rural church there, Rose Hill Church, to write her poem, View from Rose Hill. Here we have watched 10,000 seasons come and go, and unmarked graves are tangled. In the brush turn our own legs to trees, vertical forever between earth and sun. Here we are not quick to disavow the pull of field and wood and stream. We are not quick to turn upon our dreams. The university of our great nation provides the sails that allow our ship of state to negotiate issues like civil rights and the environment. Just as American writers like Mark Twain, Alice Walker, and William Faulkner anchor their work in a specific place through which they touch a global audience, the university should draw its strength from the power of both local and global worlds. The humanities are the heart of the university and are essential to this vision. As our universities and the humanities go, so will go our nation. Thank you. We just hop up? You just hop up. Um, Wendy and David, thank you for asking me to be here. I do appreciate it. Thanks to all of you for being here on a beautiful Friday afternoon. And you're about to watch me commit an act of horrible hubris. And as I commit this act of horrible hubris, I should be grateful that I have only 10 minutes. <laughs> because what I would like to do with you today is to think about Clark Kerr. And I have come to Berkeley to think about Clark Kerr. And you see what I mean by hubris. Uh, I think he is a major figure a major figure in American higher education, and it is time to rethink him and to bring him back and to see his flaws, yes, which he saw so clearly himself, but also to think of the grand things that he did. I don't have to tell Berkeley that he was born in 1911 and died in 2003. 
He lived long enough to find out, as you all know, that J. Edgar Hoover hated him and kept an FBI file on him. And the quote that I've read of his when he discovered this had a kind of the decent man's bafflement. As you know, too, he was an important architect of the 1960 master plan. He was chancellor here from 52 to 58. He was president of the whole system from 58 to 67. Then he chaired the Carnegie Commission of Higher Education and then the Council on Policy Studies in Higher Education. There is very little thinking about higher education in the last part of the 20th century that doesn't have the stamp of Clark Kerr on it. But why are we in danger of forgetting him and his legacy? He needs a big biography. He really, especially while there are those of you who knew him that can contribute to it, as well as the tapes and the publications. I asked my colleague Robert Cohn, the author of Freedom's Orator, the biography of Mario Savio. Robbie, I said, why this neglect of Clark Kerr? Why aren't you going to write this book? Why isn't someone at Berkeley going to write this big, major biography? And Robbie said, well, it's our lack of historical memory, the amnesia that we seem to be so expert in. And he also said, we lack Clark Kerr's at the moment. We lack the big university builders. We lack the grand vision, though I understand that he was called the Machiavellian Quaker <laughs> because of his ability to get things done. Some, like Arthur Levine, say, and I think we all know this, by 1980, the heroic period of growth in public education was over. That heroic period of which he was a leader. And the coming era was one of new realities, constraints, and limits. So I suppose the question for this conference is, is this true? And if it is true, is it acceptable? Cohn does see the beginning of resurrection, e.g. in that very nice essay by Patty Riley. But why? Why do we need him now? I think we need his optimism. I think we need his sense of hope. And I think we need his ability to get public investment in higher education through. I've been reading the history of the California Master Plan and what it took to get that through. And do we need someone who had big ideas as well as Machiavellian skills? His current reputation, what do we need to reconsider? You know it as well as I do. Paddy Riley neatly captures the superficial bifurcation of his reputation. On the one hand, the liberal administrator who brought universal access and international distinction to higher education in California. On the other hand, the bumbling bureaucrat who mismanaged campus unrest. Uh, Robbie Cohen puts it more kindly. He says, Kerr got caught between the left and the right, and he ends up getting burned by it. His biographer will have to judge that. And there are two contrasting images I'd like to bring to you. First, that I think many of you know, the cover of Time magazine of October 16th, 1960. Kerr is foregrounded, the bald dome of a head, the not terribly chic glasses, the coat and tie, and behind him, there is a mortarboard with a hole cut in the brim, not the brim, you know, that thing that holds it on your head, a hole cut in it, and there are floods of students coming through a university gate and entering the mortarboard. A second image. I've seen a puppet figure of Carr looking like an egghead his arms outstretched, as he would if he were a puppet, with a self-deluding caption. As you can see, there are no strings attached. And if you look at the cartoons of the period, they're a little gory. So what would resurrection mean? 
Patty Riley says, historical sophistication. Arthur Levine says, look at his three great accomplishments. Seriously confronting mass education. If I had more time, I would tell you what you already know. That enormous jump between the number of people in higher education between 1900 and 2000. Levine says, in an unfortunate metaphor, Carr did for higher education what Henry Ford did for cars. He mass produced low cost, high quality education and research potential for a nation that hungered deeply for both. And of course, these industrial metaphors madden critics of Kerr and of the corporate university. But he himself, when you read the uses of the university, he hated the metaphor of the factory. And he wrote against the metaphor of the factory. Second great contribution, he defined the modern university. He gave it its name, the Malta University. I think it still works. And he says, scrupulous man that he was, he shows all the other people who were saying it at the same time. Very few neologisms, as you know, spring from a single mouth. And third, he directed the largest scale assessment and reform effort in the history of American higher education. His commissions and councils produced 175 volumes of description and analysis. And the social scientists in this room, like my friend Barry Thorne, the social scientist, he should be like a god in the pantheon of 175 volumes, and he didn't even need to get tenure. <laughs> now, the uses of the university, lucid, candid, deeply informed, often witty. He himself said it was not poetry. He believed he was describing a new kind of university. He thought the university lived in the river of history, lived in the river of change. And he said, ah, oh, the university has, quote, no bard to sing its praises, no prophet to proclaim its vision, no guardian to protect its sanctity. He is, if no bard, no prophet, he is very realistic, he is very pragmatic, but he is, when you read this book, an improver. I don't think there's a problem he saw that in this book to which he did not offer a solution, or two solutions, or three solutions or even a laundry list of solutions. He understood, when I read this book, the keen importance of the research university and the knowledge society. But it wasn't a cheap or mechanical vision of the knowledge society. He really did see knowledge as the engine of economic and social growth that more and more people wanted. And knowledge should be able to respond to new conditions. But as you all know, the uses of the university is really two books. And there I have my edition with green leaves on it, reminiscent of this campus, perhaps. The first book were the Godkin Lectures, given in 63 and published in 64. And he was later to write that 63 was the worst possible time to have given these lectures. He said he misjudged the student revolt, and he did. And he said, at least in this book, and he said, no sitting president should ever talk as candidly as I did. In effect, he is saying, I silenced subsequent generations of presidents. But then the next book, the fifth edition in 2001, consists of the lectures, but a whole series of essays he wrote, analyzing and reanalyzing the Godkin lectures, admitting where he went wrong, looking for continuities, and he is increasingly sorrowful, increasingly a prophet without honor. And I think the people in this panel will be pleased by what distressed him. Well, maybe not Wendy, he was a little distressed about postmodernism. He was distressed about fizzling out of the reforms for undergraduates and liberal education. He believed deeply in liberal education. He believed deeply in undergraduate education. He says, my emotional attachment is to the Swarthmore of the 1930s. He is deeply disturbed about the financing on the state level for public higher education, but he never loses his sense of purpose at the university to be the city of intellect. And so despite the later sorrows, and it's often rather hard, painful reading these last essays, he has a deep commitment to the university and its purposes when he is anxious, 
It is the anxiety of a lover, and he gives himself to hope because of history. And he writes, history shows us how creative we can be. Do I have two more minutes? Yeah. Just two. But let's look at 1963. All hell is about to break loose at Berkeley. The feminine mystique is coming out in 63. The post-World War II civil rights movement is intensifying. It is the year of Martin L. King's I Have a Dream speech and the year of the Kennedy assassination. It is a book written in the teeth of blood. The major idea, of course, is that of the multi-university, a place of many sites, of infinite variety, often at odds with each other. He's very acute on power relations. He's very acute on the role of administrators and of the president. He's very acute on the history, such as federal support, that brought the research university to this place. He has faith in federal partnerships, but he's more acutely aware than he's been given credit for, for seeing the dangers of federal money. The federal influence on projects, imbalance among fields, federal money privileges science over humanities and social science, and federal money tempts us to neglect undergraduate teaching. And then he goes on in the original lectures to talk about all the other transformations. He's proud of the community colleges. He's proud of the greater involvement in the arts. And he calls on the humanities to, quote, help us find the good as well as the true and add wisdom to truth. Bill, I think you would approve of that. Yeah. Much is missing in the Godkin lectures much that he fills in later on in those other chapters. He has recommendation for our actions, more opportunities for minority, he said. Let's have an honest debate between the proponents of tradition and postmodernism. Let us improve the ethical systems of the university. Let us make better use of technology. Let us do more to help primary and secondary education. But he also here tells us a university we can be for. And there's a little bit of essentialism in what I'm about to read, but listen to it anyway. What is the justification for the modern American multiversity? History, he writes, is one answer. Consistency with the surrounding society is another. He goes on, beyond that, it has few peers in the preservation and dissemination and examination of the eternal truths, no living peers in the search for new knowledge, and no peers in all history among institutions of higher learning in serving so many of the segments of an advancing civilization. Inconsistent internally as an institution, it is consistently productive, torn by change. It has the stability of freedom and though it has not a single soul to call its own, its members pay their devotion to truth. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is a voice of a university we can be for. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi. And I, <laughs> I want to thank David and Wendy for inviting me here. I feel like an interloper, I have to say, because I am not of the humanities. Uh, I do straddle a couple of uh, different sectors of the campus at UCLA. Uh, as was said in the introduction, I am um, um, in ethnic studies as well as in psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences. Uh, I'm also an associate dean in the graduate division, so I do have a perspective of the university that is broad at this point. Um, I am so glad uh, for the presentation that just took place because it perfectly frames a lot of uh, what I've been trying to talk about today. As many of you know, we had a, a workshop uh, at noon today and I uh, spent a lot of time uh, providing some uh, basic uh, data on um, some of the uh, critical issues that I think have, uh, have compromised our ability to be uh, the university that, that we want. Uh, I spoke in particular of the increased demand on public universities for entrepreneurial practices. 
and the impact of those trends on the value system uh, that governs the socialization of both faculty and students. Uh, I argued that the demands of securing profitability and I think it's, it's not just breaking even anymore, it, it really is uh, profitability, may conflict in very significant ways with what we have traditionally considered to be the core features of university life, uh, such as the open sharing of ideas, uh, devoted mentorship, uh, the freedom to explore, uh, and equal opportunity, as I, I, I listened to uh, Kerr's vision of the low cost mass education of the future. Uh, we've come a long ways toward ending um, any, um, any possibility of that for uh, education in the large research universities. Uh, although entrepreneurship was initially conceived largely in terms of the grant raising machinery, due largely to the huge increases in funds available for the biomedical enterprise. I mean, there really was a, a hugely significant change in the availability of money uh, for the biomedical enterprise between the 1960s uh, and, and 2000, um, you know, from about 15 billion to 30 billion dollars. Uh, universities were able to build uh, the science enterprise on the basis of that money, uh, which is dwindling at this point. Uh, but that same kind of entrepreneurial uh, spirit uh, has now been extended to the desire to generate additional income through new student fee structures. Uh, so I'm really going to be talking not so much from uh, the humanitarian traditions, uh, but experientially. What I seem to be seeing on my campus that uh, seems to be um, an area that has to be addressed before we come anywhere close to the, the university, at least that I envision. So in the next few minutes, I'd like to discuss the impact of these trends on student access. Uh, the fee increases quite obviously raise the problem of affordability and whether or not high fees change the type of student who's attracted to the, to the programs uh, they want to attend or those who can even afford to attend. Uh, in my view, this is uh, an affront to the master plan, uh, which embraced uh, a far more inclusive academy. Um, in my university, certain, and I, I know that for the University of California as a whole, certain programs have been designated self-supporting and are permitted to charge special fees that go directly to the admitting school or the program. These have typically been executive type programs in business, you know, the executive MBA uh, programs in engineering and public health and in education, which are sometimes uh, paid for by corporations. And in fact, more of them used to be paid for by corporations than is the case presently. Professional schools in the UC system are also permitted to charge additional fees that can bring those fees much closer to some private tuition levels. So this year, a California resident in UCLA's MBA or law program pays about $41,000 in fees. And I'm sure most people don't know that. That's just fees. That's not support. That's basic fees at UCLA. Now, if you want to attend the executive MBA program, it's $57,000. And if you want to spend the night on Friday and Saturday, it's $63,000 per year. The site adds that scholarships are not available, but the school will help you find some loans. The obvious concern, of course, is that these high fees will discourage students without means from even applying, uh, let alone attending, if, even if you are accepted because you really have to think about you know, the cost and benefits of going so far in debt. Students are going to be saddled with loans that will compromise their ability to do much of anything else for the immediate future, but servicing their debts. Now, mind you, all of the requests to raise fees, uh, and these are formal requests that have to be made uh, to the university, to the regents, um, they are promising to devote as much as one third of the additional income generated by these fees for student support. So the claims are that these increases are not adversely affecting enrollment by underrepresented ethnic minorities or anyone else, but I have not seen this question addressed empirically across programs and schools. 
I don't believe we've held these programs accountable for the promises and the proposals. We do, however, know that nationally, the student debt load has increased dramatically in recent years. Uh, the project on student debt analyzes data from the uh, Department of Education's National Postdoctoral Secondary Postsecondary Student Aid Study, and that's something that's conducted every four years. So between 2004 and 2008, it states that the number of students graduating from four-year colleges and universities with student loan debt increased by 27 percent, from 1.1 million to 1.4 million. In 2007, in 2008, rather, 67 percent of graduating students were in debt. 62% of public school graduates and 72% of all private school graduates. Using constant dollars, the amount owed has been steadily increasing from an average of $12,750 in 96 to 23,000 in 2008. Uh, the study also showed that Pell Grant recipients who are from families making under 50,000 per year were actually much more likely to borrow and much more likely to borrow more. So these averages, of course, hardly tell the full story because many families struggle mightily, and I know that certainly my husband and I did, to pay at least part of their children's educational cost. But parental loans are not even figured into these statistics. Borrowing levels are uneven in certain students, particularly those in expensive doctoral programs that can take many years to, to complete may take on enormous loan burdens. So last year, I tried to encourage uh, a student who had just gotten her PhD in education to attend the doctoral hooding ceremony. I mean, this is the one time where you can feel so good about having completed. You get the hood and the music and all that. Clearly very bitter about her experience. She was said that being in $90,000 in debt with no job in sight, she was in no mood to celebrate her accomplishment. Not surprisingly, there is evidence that underrepresented minorities are disproportionately represented among the boroughs. Uh, a study of 2007-8 trends by the College Board Advocacy and Policy Center found that African American students are the most likely to take out loans to attend college, with only 19% graduating with no debt. Needless to say, the debt loads compromise the ability of these graduates to engage fully in society. Other key markers of maturity may have to be placed on hold. I mean, how can you think about buying a house if you're that much in debt or supporting a family, et cetera? Job choice may be more a function of economic need than personal goals. The debt load of medical school graduates has been cited as a factor in the decline of primary care physicians. In fact, one study showed that during the first five years of primary care practice, they're putting out more money than they're getting in income. So we need to examine whether or not certain types of students are disproportionately discouraged or prevented from attending by these high fees. Since corporate employment may fund attendance for some, the extent to which this route is obviously more readily available to some than others, you know, it's got to be something we look at. But the impact of rising fees is just one dimension of the potential effects of the entrepreneurial drive on student access. Uh, and I, it, it, let me just stop for a minute and, and talk about you know, how dependent universities have come on the, become on the business model. I mean, in my own department in the medical school, um, it's actually uh, required that you raise a part of your salary. Uh, and you renegotiate your salary every year on how much, based on how much money you're bringing to the table every year. If you're not bringing much to the table, your salary is going to go down. Uh, last week, I heard an NIH official at a meeting I was at say that only 14% of medical school faculties comes from hard money nowadays. All the rest is coming from someplace else. And at least at UCLA, I think everybody, every department now feels the pressure to find money, to earn money, to get more money. So I'd like to go back for a minute to that part of, on, of university entrepreneurship, the critical role of grantsmanship in income generation. Uh, because I fear that this very enterprise is shaping concepts of student desirability. And I'm going to repeat uh, an incident that I uh, talked about a little earlier today. Last year, a faculty member expressed uh, a concern to me that this graduate student students offered admission in her department, which is top rated and has a fairly high level of grant support, um, 
that there was a significant decline in the diversity of those students. She believed that it was because of the growing tendency among faculty, especially the younger faculty who were still trying to make their mark, to admit and advise only those students who had the most potential to make that faculty member a star or to at least get maximum funding. So academic apprentices, apprenticeship takes on a whole new meaning in this context. So if the motivation is your own advancement as a professor or a scientist, then you have to take students who share your interest. You have to take students who have the skills required to take your work to the next level. And you have to take the students who are more likely to be little clones of yourself. Why take a chance on someone who has distinctive interest or capabilities? And how do faculty members in such situations even define their roles? I mean, are you a teacher then? You're looking for <laughs> somebody to help you. <laughs> are you helping them? In a larger sense, when entrepreneurship becomes part of the job description for faculty, and simultaneously grants are harder to obtain, you simply have less time to work with students who may need more attention and support. Indeed, you have less time, period, since African American, Latino, and Native American students are still more likely to have been educated in schools that lack the resources to adequately prepare them for advanced education, will programs facing ent entrepreneurial imperatives be less willing to invest in promising students who may require some additional support in time? Now, I don't know of efforts to track the impact of fundraising strategies on student types, but such efforts are clearly needed, if not already underway. The fundraising trends being employed today are, are not likely to change, but I think we have to make certain that the efforts are mounted to ensure that these mechanisms do not compromise access by the populations that most need the benefits of advanced education. Now, I don't imagine that uh, the system of support for universities that they've devised this business model is going to come crashing down soon. Uh, but it is clear to me that the current levels of support are unsustainable. I mean, we know that NIH funding, for example, NSF funding is leveling out, in fact, decreasing to some extent. Uh, and when the TARP funds go away, you know, there could be a crash within the next couple of years. Even corporate support has dwindled in the recent economic economic climate. So we're going to have to find a model of support and profit sharing uh, that I believe uh, comes from a new appreciation from the university as a whole. At some point, we're going to have to distill from the kind of chaotic array before us the core values that we really do wish to inculcate in students as well as in faculty because you realize faculty are being socialized by this system just as much as students. Your whole conception of what matters, what doesn't matter, you know, what is truth, what is not truth, you know, what, uh, what is the measure of success and what is not the measure of success uh, is being altered in the faculty. My great fear is that this, this, the decision-making structures that allow, that would allow us to change this system are themselves undergoing change. You know, as universities are increasingly being run by business folks, people with MBAs, you know, people who come from corporations on the outside. I mean, my university has a, uh, a firm that uh, we employ right now that comes in to make uh, uh, assessments, accountability assessments. Uh, you know, as, as those are the folks that are increasingly running our universities, you know, what are the options for change, the kind of change I think that, that we all think have to be made? Um, I'm going to suggest that people get much more involved in governance on their campuses, get much more involved in searches, get much more involved in opportunities to understand the financial basis of your university. Um, Kate spoke of the need for optimism, and I'm going to try to keep an optimistic approach to this whole thing, but uh, I think we're facing a, a, a serious turning point, and it's going to need engagement from the whole to turn the ship around. Thank you.
Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be here in this great university. Uh, I am going to be a little bit, well, I can't be less upbeat, I think, than Belinda was. But I'm not very upbeat about a number of things. One of them, by the way, and I, I think we need to talk about it, is the University of California system. I mean, I see it from a great distance, but the implication of uh, Kate's talk, in a way, is what we ought to aspire to is Clark Kerr's vision, and I assume the goals that he had, uh, and the goal was to create a great system in a great state, and that happened. Although, as Kate indicated, there were problems with that. But you know, to go back to the tuition discussion we just had, the Chronicle of Higher Education reported last week that you are the first and only public uh, institution of higher education that has a $50,000 annual you know, out-of-state tuition that may or may not be a category you want to be in. But if you come back to the uh, critique that Belinda just had, I think you ought to worry about it. Um, and it is, by the way, typical of what is happening across the country. There are now, and I, I didn't bring the, the piece with me, but there, there are roughly 100 institutions of higher education in this country whose, and it's not just tuition, tuition fees, the package that you have to pay to send an undergraduate, 100 institutions that charge $50,000 or more. It goes up to 57000 at Sarah Lawrence, which for a long time has been the most uh, expensive. But now Berkeley is on that list. It's up from eight 10 years ago. Uh, now, and there hasn't been that much inflation, by the way, over the last <laughs> 10 years. So these are, these are real numbers, and they're, they're scary numbers. But it raises the question that we're here to talk about, is what is the university uh, that we want? And of course, a sub-question there is, can we get it? Or, or what would we have to do uh, in order to get it? I have a, uh, a narrow vision, much narrower vision uh, of this than Clark Kerr did, because I'm primarily concerned about one part of the great university. The university I want is what I would call the collegiate university. That is, the university that affords undergraduate education a place of precedence. That has to be, obviously, in a research university uh, simultaneous with the uh, accomplishment of research, and that's not going away, and it shouldn't go away as a primary goal of the institution. But to the extent, and I think it's very real, that we have slighted undergraduate education, and we are giving our undergraduates uh, something decidedly less than they deserve, then I think we really need to take a hard look in the mirror and ask ourselves if that's who we want to be. Uh, I was walking on the campus this morning, and I saw all those beautiful um, posters that you've got hanging. Uh, and they really are gorgeous. Uh, and uh, I hope those students had as wonderful an education as they say. I assume, <laughs> I assume they did. Uh, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't think we can take it for granted. So what's the problem? I think we all know what the problem is. But let me just talk quickly about a number of things here. A lot of things have changed, obviously, over the last 50 years. I don't want to use that as a period. I think the, the great period of American public higher education has been roughly the last 50 years. Uh, and Kate situated us, us in that with Clark Kerr. But there have been an enormous number of changes over that period of time. My career spans that, uh, so that I, I came into the profession at a very different time. I came into a very different university. Uh, I've taught in private and public universities. I taught at the University of Wisconsin. But the university, even the one I'm in now, which is probably the most distinctive in the country, is still different from the university into which I was introduced. I started teaching in 1960. And these 50 years have seen uh, a lot of change. Uh, and it's not all good from my point of view. So what? The big one, obviously, the most obvious one, is change in, uh, and I'm going to talk about faculty for a moment, change in faculty attitudes. And I mean by that primarily, um, a loss, I think, on the whole, there are obviously lots of exceptions here. I don't want to do, use broad strokes of a sense of mission, of a sense of professionalism, of the sense that we are in this because we have a calling to teach, that to be a professor means something. We are professing something that is meaningful. You know all of that. But I think it's not very often said, and I think it's worth saying. I still think that's the right ideal for us, and I think we have to work hard to make that the ideal of younger people in the profession. 
the second thing is the whole economy of higher education, and that is it's basically the weakening of faculty commitment to the institutions in which they teach. We move from university to university. We move from project to project. We have more, we frequently to more commitment to our profession nationally and internationally than to the particular university in which we serve. Uh, we are more international than, than national. All of these things have their justifications, but they hurt the university. They hurt the university in which we live and reside, and that's, I think, where change has to begin. But um, the flip side of that is I think we have also lost a sense of commitment to community and service. Uh, the old 1862 ideal in this country is just that. Uh, it's been growing weaker, I suppose, ever since 1862, so that's a very long picture. But I think it's really taken a hit over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, there are a whole lot of reasons for that, among them that we are simply too busy. Uh, to do the right thing, and I think that's a real factor, uh, by the way. Uh, the biggest one, of course, is the most obvious one, and that is our commitment to research as our primary, if not our only goal. We're in this business because we're researchers. That's how we get evaluated. That's how we get rewarded. Uh, that's what we do for a living, and everything else is secondary, if that. Uh, this has meant, I think, that uh, there have been structural changes in the university, including the reduction of teaching loads, even in the humanities. It used to be just the, the sciences and technology that showed this. Now humanists are able to comp compete for lighter teaching loads. Um, and they can do more research if they do that, but they do less teaching. It goes without saying. There, has, there are other factors uh, that are out of our control or appear to be a tremendous increase in the administrative load of faculties. A whole lot of reasons, again, uh, for that. Focus on graduate students and increasingly on postdocs rather than on undergraduate students. The tendency in our teaching to narrow down our teaching to our research specialties it's harder and harder to get faculty to teach broad and synthetic courses. And the result is our curricula tend to be comprised of a series of mini focuses on whatever it is the faculty have, happen to be interested in. And since what we're looking for is stars, not, uh, stars not in any particular constellation, <laughs> we wind up with people whose uh, interests don't cohere in terms of an undergraduate curriculum because what we're doing is accumulating faculty research interests. All of these things you know about, all of them, I think, are terrible problems. We also have problems of esprit across the university, and that is because, and Belinda has referred to this, the tremendous asymmetries. Uh, that we have introduced, and that's largely, I think, in the last 25 or 30 years. Asymmetries of salary. Um, have you ever compared what your average professor of French makes as compared to your average professor of astrophysics? It's a, it's a devastating kind of comparison, I assure you. And the same thing is true with teaching loads. Uh, the same thing is true with certain kinds of administrative responsibilities. Uh, we no longer, we've abandoned the ideal of the single faculty, and this has had a dramatic impact on how we think of ourselves as a community, uh, as a community with a common uh, mission. I don't think we have that much uh, anymore. And finally, something nobody's mentioned so far, but I think it's huge, and that is the, the wild, the radical expansion of contingent faculty. Uh, most of us tenured faculty are quite content to have half or more of the courses taught by poorly paid, overworked people, um, often as competent as we are, uh, but they're cheap. Um, their labor can be manipulated in ways that are very useful to the university, and frankly, we are profiting on their backs. Um, that, too, doesn't do much to make us uh, the kind of community we, we ought to be. As I say, I think I've only said what everybody in this room uh, knows. You know, so if you step back and look at it, the question you want to ask is, you know, where is Mrs. Chips when we need her? Uh, and the answer is that she can't make a living in this university, and we all know, we all know that. Is it possible to restore her? I don't know, but that's what I want to, uh, to talk about. But I think all of these factors I've talked about have uh, have a tremendously negative app, uh, um, impact on the university I would like to see. For instance, we're conveying our same sense of specialization and research orientation to our graduate students. For most of us, that's our primary job. 
Our primary job is training them in the same nar narrow specialties uh, that we have developed for ourselves. And by the way, in most institutions, we don't provide them any systematic training, any training worth the name, in pedagogy. I was on an American Historical Association uh, project about 10 years ago to review doctoral training in history. We surveyed 157 history departments. We found three that claim to be providing doctoral teaching training for their students. As far as I could tell, only one, and it was Stanford, by the way, seemed actually um, to, to be doing it. Well, that's our fault. Uh, so even if our students are interested in teaching them, we seldom give them the mentoring to make that possible, and it's almost impossible, unless you have the courage to, to tell them to go teach in liberal arts colleges, um, to be able to exercise those skills. There is no market in the university anymore for those skills, uh, despite our uh, defensive rhetoric uh, about that. The final thing I, I like to mention, and this comes close to the bone, I think, is that we have also adopted attitudes over the last 20, 30, 40 years that I think have been very destructive, mainly in the way that we are perceived by the general pu public. I would say it's the turn to theory and modeling across the humanities and social sciences that has done a tremendous amount of damage. I think our commitment to political correctness and to identity politics has hurt us very badly. Uh, and we need to think about how to think more about how to present ourselves in the light of what's happened to our own community over this very long period of time. The last factor that I'd like to mention, and it's one that I really care most about, is that I think we have lost our way, and this is something that Clark Kerr was simply not interested in, uh, in thinking about liberal education in the research university. After all, the historic notion of the research university is that it provides a liberal edu education for undergraduates. That's not an oxymoron. That's what we started off to do. That's what all the great reports of the mid 20th century said. If you go back to the Harvard Red Book uh, just after the war, that's the basic, that we are in the business of training for democracy. And the way we do that, and there's a double way to do that, by giving general education, however you describe it, core curricula more recently, general education in the first couple of years and specialized education in the last two years, the major and general education. We've gotten very good at the major and we have pretty much abandoned general education. Most of us have crude distribution systems. My own, my own university does. We still have a system that James McCosh developed in the 1890s and we think it's just grand and it's, ter <laughs> it, it's terrible. I served on a uh, commission in this state a few years ago on uh, uh, undergraduate education, liberal education, general education uh, here. It was a wonderful exercise. I'd be interested in knowing from those of you in the system whether anything has happened in response to that report. I'd be delighted to hear that it has, but I haven't heard that so far. But it may be that I don't know, uh, that I really don't know. But that seems to me absolutely key. Just as important, and it relates to the other part of it, is of course that we have developed a university structurally that is run by departments. Not run by faculty, it's run by disciplinary departments. And what they privilege is disciplinary orientation. Very hard uh, to break through that. But they're the ones who control the budget of the university. Don't kid yourself that you as faculty members do. I think we all know that. So uh, that's a range of problems. The final range of problems I want to mention is the students. Um, that is to say, we have a different student body uh, than the students I first taught. Lots, uh, for many reasons, it's a better and more interesting student body. I taught an entirely homogeneous student body when I started to teach her pretty much. Um, homogeneous student body. Now it's wildly different. That's just pure gain. I can't see any downside uh, to that. Uh, and it's, this diversity has really been uh, superb in a lot of ways. And it's diversity, by the way, of a multitude of different kinds. And after all, the GI Bill uh, was uh, what democratized uh, access to higher education initially, and we've expanded on it since then. But I've just got a list of things here. I'm writing something about this. Uh, secondary school preparation, that's what I've been referred to. Uh, the vocational orientation of undergraduates. I think the increasing status anxiety among undergraduates, uh, helicopter parents, uh, the uh, stimulation and distraction of the media, I think it's a double-edged sword. Um, 
the uh, seeming insatiable demand of undergraduates for amenities, health, cons counseling, dormitories, athletics, and of course this is a self-inflicted wound which we, uh, which we foster in order to compete with other universities. We know we're doing it and we do it uh, uh, in any case. So where does that leave us? You know, there are all kinds of problems I, I referred to, an awful lot of them. There are certainly problems with the faculty. There are problems with the students. But I think it doesn't help to blame the universities for this. The only people who have a chance of doing something to address the situation is, is us. You know, it's the POGO principle. We have met the enemy, and it's us. Uh, I think it is. Uh, there are forces out there that are very difficult for, uh, for us to control. But I think this is a political case that's a winner. If we would have the courage to get up and say that one, perhaps the most important reason we are in business, and I don't want to use that term, <laughs> is to serve undergraduates, to educate uh, undergraduates for democracy. If we would be willing to internally divert resources to that, I think you'd have a much better san san chance or excuse me, of convincing the people to whom we are now beholden uh, that we have uh, a mission that is supportable, that is consistent, indeed necessary, for the practice of a great and international democracy. And if we don't do that, I don't think we deserve to succeed. Thanks. Next is Jim Clifford. Um, can I ask the folks in the back, do you know where to turn these lights on? For our aging eyes, it's getting pretty dark. Is it right there? Okay, thanks to the inviters, and since I'm from Santa Cruz, I'll skip the stuff about what a great university Berkeley is. <laughs> uh, the university we are for, the context created by David and Wendy, and that means no quetching. We're all very good about, at that. And license to want, not to settle for something, a permission to think big, to be utopian for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, I'm doing this from a humanities location, but uh, I hope humanities is in quotation marks. It's a lot wider than, uh, than that, ultimately. And it's an exhortation to think big, to resist the forces of belittlement and the defensive uh, maneuvers and lowering of sights that we see everywhere. Uh, that's how I see the assignment. I take the liberty of a certain irresponsibility, a modest proposal. All the devils and the details can be left for later and for those of you who still have to attend faculty meetings. <laughs> Not too long ago, I was the humanities rep for a uh, search for our campus provost. And we were interviewing someone in the San Jose airport who was a big dean at a big university. And he said something like, well, you have six divisions, basically six divisions in the university. And if you're lucky and we have these schools, maybe you have seven or eight. And then he went on to talk about funding. And, uh, but I was lost. I was stuck on the numbers. I was sort of naively shocked, naively. Because when I entered graduate school, we were in an arts and sciences university. We were worrying about C.P. Snow's two cultures, two. <laughs> and I felt I had lived in half the landscape. And now in the airport, I was part of a very thin and shrinking slice of the pie. And I think we can all recognize this shock, the fact, and seemingly irreversible trend of belittlement. There's been a lot of soul searching and blaming over the reduction of the humanities to a minor position in the university, a necessary garnish for the main course, the practical fields that lead to jobs, help the economy, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need to elaborate. But I want to persuade you that there, are, there exists, there are an already existing vital greater humanities that cuts across the university's departmental and divisional lines. And this is not a narrow or shrinking wedge of the pie. But we don't know what to call it. In the 1970s, there was the phrase human sciences was, I, I think, an attempt to name a more expansive humanities. But it didn't last long. Nor do we know how to activate this actually existing greater humanities institutionally. Disciplinary and divisional turfs and traditions these legacies from the early 20th century are obvious obstacles, yet we can't just wish them away. The name Greater Humanities is obviously a placeholder. 
It may sound like bravado or a kind of quixotic imperialism. So I hasten to say that it came to me out of the blue. And, and I realized that I was thinking, uh, the, uh, what I was really thinking of was the phrase, the greater New York. I grew, up on, <laughs> I grew up in Manhattan, and I took the subway, and there was this big map, you know, and there were these places at the end of the line, you know, Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, that I didn't really know about. And then there was our power company, Con Ed, that was, had a little sign saying, Degree must for a greater New York. And anyway, this idea got planted in my mind. <laughs> the name is less important now than simply recognizing an already existing reality, an overlapping set of assumptions epistemologies and methods that add up to a large, dynamic, and deeply rooted configuration of knowledge practices, linking and potentially opening up the disciplinary traditions. What characterizes this configuration of knowledge practices? I'm going to hazard a quick sketch, uh, subject, of course, to debate and emendation. And I, I'm painting with a broom here, obviously. So the greater humanities are four things. At least four things, I think. One, they're interpretive. Two, they're realist. Three, they're historical. And four, they're ethico-political. A few words on each. One, interpretive. You might read textual and philological, in, but in a broad sense, much broader than the literary senses of those words, text and philology. Meaning, in any event, not positivist. Interested in rigorous, but always provisional and perspectival explanations, not replicable causes. Two, realist, and these overlap, of course. Realist. By realist, I mean, I don't mean objective. It means concerned with the narrative, figural, and empirical construction of textured, non-reductive, multi-scaled representations of social, cultural, and psychological reality. Serious representations that are necessarily partial and contestable. Historical, my third, meaning not evolutionist, or at least not in the teleological sense. Historical in the sense of recognizing the temporal and spatial, we might say the chronotopic specificity of, well, everything. <laughs> Evolutionist, perhaps in a Darwinian sense, a real Darwinian sense, a rigorous grappling with always developing temporalities, everything being constantly made and unmade in determinate material situations, but developing without any guaranteed direction. And four, ethico-political. Never content, never, not stopping with an instrumental or technical bottom line. It's never enough to say that something must be true because it works or because people want or need it. Where does it work? For whom? At whose expense? Contextualizing always involves constitutive outsides that come back to haunt us and our effects of power. You may disagree with my shorthand characterizations, but I hope you'll recognize a set of intellectual dispositions, a habitus, that link the humanities a lot of the social sciences and the theoretically informed arts. Of course, seen as disciplinary formations, many of the fields of study I'm invoking here are themselves divided in specific versions of the two cultures' opposition. They're important arguments, these arguments that happen within the, the departments and the disciplines. They've been around for some time and are exacerbated by the current resource pinch in the university. But my agenda is not the health or inner comity of the disciplines, historical communities which will or will not find ways to keep talking to each other. And I should say too that many of the dispositions I've identified above are active in the so-called hard sciences. Many individual scientists are potential allies or fellow travelers of the actually existing greater humanities. In some ultimate utopia, the university would be healed of all its divisions. But as far as I can see into the possibly realistic future, this is not in the cards. And it seems more important now to develop a vision and supporting institutions of two more or less equal, dynamic, and open-ended academic cultures. Some of us will recall, by the way, that they weren't really equal or equally vital cultures for C.P. Snow, who tended to portray scientists as representing the future humanities, the past. We don't want it all. We just want our half. 
So here's a sketch, a, a sketch map of the greater humanities by disciplines, most of them internally divided. Literature itself an archipelago. History, also very widely extended, and now including many things, art history, visual culture, and why not, archaeology. Philosophy, still sharply divided along two cultures, hard and soft, analytic, continental lines. Maybe, well, one hopes not, but linguistics, also a divided field. But do we need to choose between the traditions of Sapir and Chomsky? All the studies programs, the interdisciplines, American studies, women's, feminist, ethnic, cultural studies. By the way, these are the places where diversity, uh, the increase in the menaced increase in diversity in our university are most pronounced. Uh, science and technology studies. Sociocultural anthropology, which is my altar home and where I've never felt I was not doing humanities research. Uh, and historical archaeology, human geography, qualitative sociology, some of environmental studies, film, digital media, communications, important sectors of politics, economics, psychology. <laughs> well, maybe not so important in economics. <laughs> but there, it's there, the important, the theoretical arts, including theater arts and performance studies. Now this leaves out a great deal, I'm sure, but the map is, I trust, big enough to make my basic and rather crude point. Real dialogue uh, can only take place between equals, and we are not equals in the contemporary university. This is a fact and a growing trend, driven by material, political, and economic forces, which I think I don't need to belabor for this audience, and which we've already been hearing about. STEM. You know that acronym? Science, tech, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Belinda Tucker has noted uh, that there's a growing divide in this area of the university from the liberal arts. When I think about the situation and our position in it, I'm actually sent back to my graduate school days when, uh, uh, where I was a student of H. Stuart Hughes. He was an uh, intellectual historian who taught at Harvard back when. He wrote a book, Consciousness and Society, in, in 1958, which was influential on me at the time. It was a reaction to the 50s boom in social sciences. This was Talcott Parsons and the Harvard context. But Hughes begins with what he calls the revolt against positivism, which was really a way of describing the work of a generation of founding figures in social science, Weber, Durkheim, Croce, Freud, Marx, and Gramsci. These founders of social science turned out to be non-reductive, imaginative, yes, humanistic thinkers concerned with the unconscious, with indeterminate behaviors, motivations, and all the rest. The revolt against positivism that Hughes described wasn't then and isn't now a revolt against science, but against a narrow instrumentalist vision of science, a vision that fetishizes quantifiable, auditable outcomes, immediately useful, but to whom? And marketable, to whose benefit? Does this sound familiar? I'm updating Hughes's 1950s intervention uh, to the neoliberal present, where we confront an economistic positivism perfectly adapted to the sink or swim bootstraps, find your own grant support, privatized logics of an entrepreneurial system of rewards. The greater humanities are an attempt to imagine a coalition based on already existing affinities that could form a historic block, if you allow me the Gramscian language, that could be a big, broadly based enough coalition to be an effective counterweight to and interlocutor with the STEM sectors that today increasingly call the shots. Let me conclude. I'm concluding. I'm quite sure that the necessary alliances across the map of affinities I've sketched out cannot be achieved from a primary base in the humanities, seen as an academic division. One of my messages is the humanities are not a division. The name Greater Humanities is thus basically an exhortation to think big and relationally, an exhortation not to circle the wagons, either at departmental or divisional scales, and to go beyond niche thinking. If we protect ourselves in this way, as we sometimes must, 
we will do nothing to counter the present structural forces of belittlement. We will keep getting smaller and more marginal. The big institutional block I'm imagining, and I have no concrete immediate instructions on how to build it, cannot look like a more robust humanities division, and there will need to be departmental reconfigurations. There should be. Why is history or philosophy inviolable? There's nothing sacred about these institutional units. It's often noted that the constantly hyphenating natural sciences don't worry a lot about disciplinary centers and borders, do they? I'm arguing that we keep our eye on the prize even as we fight our immediate battles for resources. We need to work toward a multiplex, adaptive, hyphenating and connecting knowledge space that is, as I've suggested, fundamentally interpretive, realist, historical, and ethico-political. As we achieve this in a differently configured university, and it will be differently configured, that I can promise you, the humanities will disappear in a glowing metamorphosis. <laughs> Frank Donahue. Well, I want to thank David and Wendy as well um, for bringing me here and thank all of you for, for attending. Um, as uh, I think Wendy made clear by her rehearsal of some of the titles of my publications, I'm not a really big solutions guy. So part of my paper will be inviting you to offer some solutions. So I hope you can cooperate. Um, in the earlier session today, um, I devoted my time to reviewing a couple of recent books, Jackson Tobey's The Lowering of Higher Education in America and Richard Vedder's Going Broke by Degrees, Why College Costs Too Much. These are conservative critiques of the higher education, partly funded respectively by the Olin Foundation and the American Enterprise Institute. They focus on the question of whether access to higher education in the US ought to be A, a civic responsibility, that is an entitlement, or B, some other entity characterized by sharply curtailed government spending. Not surprisingly, both authors come down quite firmly on the side of option B. But both raise issues that we all need to consider. Most importantly, they outline the fact that the funding of higher education in America is a mess, a hodgepodge of state subsidies to institutions, private donations, both individual and corporate, a small pool of grants to students, and most ominously, a booming student loan industry that both authors believe is precarious and unsustainable. Toby, in particular, makes the key observation that the loans are currently not tied to students' academic performance, and that this could set the stage for a massive wave of defaults as mediocre students either drop out or graduate and find themselves unable to find jobs good enough to enable them to pay off the debt that they have amassed. Thus, regardless of one's politics, one has to come away from both these books persuaded that funding of higher education in America is a problem desperately in need of a solution. This afternoon, for this session, I'd like to examine one proposed solution, but one that would apply not in the United States, but in Great Britain. The report, Securing a Sustainable Future for Higher Education, is brand new, issued on October 12th of this year, so I'll assume that many of you are relatively unfamiliar with it, although Kate has a copy. Um, <laughs> and I'll thus devote a fair amount of time to summarizing it. But it contains a number of radical propositions or provisions, and even though it is yet to be debated by, in Parliament, it is already wildly controversial. And I believe we need to consider its implications, not only for Britain, but for the United States, extremely seriously. The report summarizes an extensive and comparative review of higher education led by Lord Brown of Mattingly. It is universally referred to as the Brown Report, and makes sweeping recommendations for change. Parts of the report will no doubt strike Americans as quite progressive, but that simply reflects the fact that, until now perhaps, Britain's higher education system is more progressive than ours. For example, students pay no tuition up front. They only begin paying for college once they begin working, and even then pay nothing until they are earning at least 21,000 pounds a year. 
their payments would, according to the Brown Report, be capped at 9% of their income. That's up from the current 6%. They decrease if the graduate's earnings decrease and are suspended altogether for any period during which the graduate is unemployed. That part of the report sounds rosy compared to the American tuition and loan repayment system. But in fact, the Brown Report would move higher education dramatically away from the entitlement that it currently is, or near entitlement, at least in Britain. Doug Letterman, in an Inside Higher Education article published shortly after the report came out, offers a neat summary of why this is so, and I'm quoting Letterman here. Like many European countries, England had long erred on the side of striving to keep student fees low. In 2006, as economic conditions began to worsen and the unsustainability of the country's financing model became clearer, the central government approved a controversial plan to nearly triple the ceiling of what universities could charge students from, 11, from 1,175 pounds to 3,000 pounds a, a year, roughly $5,500 at the time, given the exchange rate then. Um, perhaps predictably, virtually every institution charged that much, that 3,000 pounds, essentially turning the figure from a cap into a floor. This controversial piece of legislation, by the way, almost cost um, Tony Blair his job. Um, Brown would go on, the Brown report, Brown and his report, would go a drastic step farther, eliminating tuition caps altogether and inviting universities to compete for students by setting their own fee schedules. It does set a soft cap of 6,000 pounds beyond which the government would not, pay, would not subsidize fees in the form of carrying student loan debt, but this figure could eventually double and does not set out model, and, and the report does set out models even now that would charge 12,000 pounds a year in student fees. What does this mean? The BBC News makes it absolutely clear that students will be the losers. Quote, there's no escaping the fact that they are going to be paying more, borrowing more, and paying back at a higher rate of interest. A, a, a UCL, the UCU Lectures Union, this is the largest organization of academic workers in the UK, said the plan was, quote, the final nail in the coffin of affordable higher education, unquote. Not quite sure how I feel about the metaphor, the core metaphor of affordable higher education as a coffin, but you get the point of the quotation at least, I think. Um, Arthur M. Hauptman, a public policy consultant specializing in higher education, said that the change would, quote, catapult Britain past the United States in terms of shifting the burden of financing higher education from the state to the students. In other words, um, all at once, um, making an enormous change. Um, in other words, if the United States has gradually been shifting in its understanding of higher education from entitlement to freestanding enterprise, the Brown Report would have Britain do it all in one shot. Principle number one of the report is, of the report is that, quote, higher education institutions must persuade students that they should pay more in order to get more a preposterous understatement given the numbers being considered. Another key provision of the Brown Report would make uh, our topic, the university we are for, an urgent concern for British faculty and students alike. It recommends that government spending for higher education be cut by 40% over the next four years, and that it be directed nearly exclusively to funding the teaching of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the STEM subjects just mentioned. Um, the, quote, almost total annihilation, as one university administrator described it to the BBC, of instructional subsidies for virtually all the humanities and social science fields would save the government about 3.5 billion pounds a year. In other words, part of the plan to sustain higher education by scaling back on government support would entail directly intervening in the curriculum in a way that would fundamentally alter what a college degree and likely graduate degrees would look like. I argued in a recent Chronicle article that the humanities would not likely exist in American universities of the 21st century. Were the Brown Report to become policy, I would definitely give them an even shorter lifespan in the British universities. The increase in tuition would likely influence the, the dominant mode of instruction as well. 
a BBC News education reporter suggests that online learning will become much more popular, quote, with the cost of university set to rise considerably, many are more likely to study for their degrees in cheaper, more flexible ways, perhaps through digitally based distance learning providers, unquote. Distance learning suits the in intensive curricular uh, focus on STEM subjects extremely well. And early, quote, uh, as of 2000, shareholders report from Apollo Group, that's the parent company of the University of Phoenix, mm -hmm. expressed a wish to granularize its curriculum. Granularize it, that's their term. Rendering it, it, it absolutely uniform from one campus to the next. Granularization, though, um, <laughs> works well for math and sciences, but not at all for the humanities. All the most prominent boosters of online learning in the United States, William Massey, Robert Zemsky, Carol Twig, and others, um, agree that the humanities is not an area, and this is the way they speak, is not an area of, quote, codified knowledge and algorithmic skills, <laughs> and is thus a poor candidate for IT-enhanced learning. That factor alone will contribute significantly to its near annihilation from British universities and from the British curriculum. So how does the Brown Report impact American education? A huge question, and it would be even if it were too soon to assess in any profound way the results of this week's midterm elections in our country. So I look forward to hearing your answers in our ensuing discussion. This is how I'm passing the buck. Um, especially because I myself don't have any at the moment. Um, so let me stick with speculations, though I have no um, confidence that they will be borne out. First, let's start with the British political situation, which should actually sound very familiar. In May of this year, the new, curricula the new coalition government of conservatives and liberal Democrats reached an agreement that focused on t two key issues, deficit reduction and a comprehensive review of government spending. The Brown Report began before the coalition was formed, in the summer of 2009, but its recommendations clearly reflect the coalition's priorities. But the, that coalition is universally characterized as extremely fragile. So who knows how the debate over the Brown Report will go, whether it will be adopted as is, in bits and pieces, or not at all. We simply won't know until parliamentary debate begins. Of course, thanks to the early activity of the extremely conservative Tea Party in the United States, deficit reduction and a review of government spending were top priorities in this year's American elections. Even if one believes, as I do, that the Tea Party movement was largely co-opted by other interests in the Republican Party, the issues it raised initially, however manically, are bound to be with us for at least the next election cycle. Not just Tea Partiers, but establishment Republicans who seem, though they rarely admit it, embarrassed by the fiscal irresponsibly, irresponsibility of the Bush administration and determined to prove it by being more tight-fisted than ever, and even moderate and conservative Democrats will keep government spending clearly in view. Thus, I don't rule out the possibility of a study like the Brown Report, um, and possibly even a bill um, may be introduced sometime in the next two years. What becomes of it, though, again, is anybody's guess. As for mandated curricular reform, the Obama administration focuses intently on education in STEM subjects. But curricular reform in the United States, at least at the college level, tends to develop from the bottom up and is heavily influenced by student desires. Since Harvard introduced the free elective curriculum in 1876, the US higher education curriculum has tended more and more towards a consumerist model in which students decide which disciplines will thrive business, computer science, and which ones will die, classics. The last year in which a majority of students graduated with a liberal arts major, English, philosophy, history, language, political science, was 1970. So we're already a long ways past what the liberal arts used to look like. The annual survey of freshmen conducted by UCLA's Higher Education Research Institute tends to show that in time of recession, business gives way to the hard sciences as the most popular major, I think, and again, this is just my speculation, and I'm eager to hear yours, is that undergraduates deciding what our college curricula will look like in the, in the future. 
I've spent my time today both in the early session and this one dwelling exclusively on higher education, financial and political policy, because I believe that if we in academia are to define the university we're for, we first need to have a clear understanding of how the state would define it for us. I hope my remarks have been helpful. Thanks. Great. So uh, we have just half an hour to talk. And you're welcome to ask questions, offer your own vision of the university you are for, um, or engage in arguments. And um, I guess, uh, how, how important is it for the tech people that we use this? It's very important? OK, it's very important. I'm going to pass this back, and you can use it. Could you just bring it? Thank you. Um, I, w I want to um, uh, take some suggestions from the last speaker there. And um, I, I think the first thing, yeah. OK, um, the first thing that needs to be said about Britain is it doesn't have tenure. Yes. OK, and, and I think that, that that needs to be brought out. The second thing, perhaps, is that your tenure at the University of California is not as secure as you think it is. It's actually in the um, smallest department in which you teach. If that department gets abolished, you, your tenure That's is right. gone. Yeah. So I, I just want, if I may, just make one or two um, comments about basically two things. First of all, uh, the role of the scholar in society and related issues like tenure and accreditation and so on. And secondly, the use of online media. So it's worth saying about Britain, they abolished tenure in a very brutal way in the late 80s. Yes. And it actually centered on a case featuring a gentleman called Edgar Page, who was a lecturer in English in Hull. And um, his uh, tenure, he thought, was secure because um, he had been tenured before the Thatcher Universities Act. Mm -hmm. But they told him he was made involuntarily redundant, and that was the end of it. So um, Page's case actually went to the House of Lords, mm -hmm. and uh, he lost on a technicality. So he ended up, um, he ended up uh, getting some uh, compensation um, by a, an employment tribunal there, and it, it was over. That was, that was actually the end of tenure in, in Britain. Mm. Now, I think it, it's important to see their new proposal in, in that context. It's also worth saying that in Britain this year, they had 150,000 qualified graduates who actually didn't get into university. So there's stuff happening there which is incredible. Um, I, if I may just um, interpose just another anecdote, which I think you'll find relevant. Um, this happened to Edgar Page in Hull, and they sent the head of the law department in Hull to become um, our university head at Dublin City University. So for the first time, actually, in world history, the gentleman's name is, is Ferdinand von Prunzinski, um, which is a good Irish name like Donoghue, yeah. <laughs> or Clifford, yeah. So, 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 um, so uh, Ferdinand, uniquely, brought a case to the Supreme Court uh, in 2009, arguing for his right to summarily dismiss senior academics. By summarily, it meant that he actually literally said, clean your desk, and here's three months salary. So this um, lost, uh, his, his case actually lost again on, on a um, technicality. But this um, um, brought us around to, again, the um, industrial relations area. And um, we then had uh, another case which actually ma made a lot of national media in Ireland. I'm just mentioning this because academic tenure is a huge um, uh, national media um, issue in Ireland. So let's, let's talk about um, this. The, the role of the scholar in society, I believe, needs, needs to be um, looked at. I think we have to look at ourselves. Um, have we, in fact, been domesticated by the universities? Um, is there a case to be made? I notice, um, Professor Donahue, your, your articles are on, on things like uh, why publish and stuff like that. Is there a case to be made, for example, the East Anglia so-called climate gate fiasco um, is essentially, it was just uh, business as usual in the sciences. Um, marginalization of dissenting views, um, uh, emails that would look like criminal conspiracy if they had been in Wall Street. And isn't there a case essentially for putting all this research um, on the web uh, put all the reviews on the web with it, end the practice of anonymous reviewing, and this can all be done for a very minor amount of money. 
But the final point I want to make is on the web in general. Um, I think it was uh, Professor Katz who actually mentioned that if you're setting up an undergraduate degree at the moment, you have a huge problem that you have uh, a bunch of individuals at the university who are rock stars in their, in their separate disciplines. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are hundreds I'm of... I'm going to ask you just to creep up on the resolution sure, sure. here. Hundreds of brilliant courses, uh, for example, MIT have put all their courses on the web. Mm -hmm. Why not? take one of these courses instead. For example, in my area, computer science, there are superb courses on um, algorithms and linear algebra. Why not use these courses and pay um, uh, one of the many unemployed PhDs who are out there $20 an hour actually to tutor the students? Mm -hmm. um, do we actually need the whole infrastructure of administrators which have grown, grown up around universities and research and so on? Shouldn't we, in fact, cast off the fetters as scholars that the state university has put around us. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, I'm just, can I just sure. collect two more oh, questions cool. and then we'll just see what the panel wants to do with this, okay? I know that was directly to you and provokes you. So, <laughs> <laughs> and um, thank you, David. So we're gonna go right here and um, if you would identify yourself, actually, could, yes. could we back up one and have you identify yourself so that people know who you are? Yes. It's okay, you can just say it. Sure. With, um, uh, I'm actually um, Sean Adulon, and I'm actually uh, notorious in Ireland for a blog called academictenure.blogspot.com. Uh, check the news on it. Too. Great. Thank you. Great. Okay. I'm, <clears throat> I'm John Gillis, and um, I'll be much shorter. Um, I want to ask the panel to participate in a thought experiment, um, and that thought experiment follows on Stan Katz and several others of you who believe, obviously, that <clears throat> the university is now, yes, <laughs> doing all kinds of things that have little to do with its basic function, mm -hmm. the education of young people. The experiment goes as follows. What if we reduced everything to that function and stripped away everything else around us here at Berkeley and throughout the country? What kind of reduction in cost could we get out of that? Um, does anybody have any ideas on this? My guess is, given the fact that the number of administrators at universities now equal the faculty, mm -hmm. that sports activities now gobble up huge resources, and I'll quit here, my guess is it would be up to 75% of cost savings. Okay, let me just take one more and then I'll let you answer, okay? All right, I'll turn to the panel. Oh, I'm sorry, was there somebody? Oh, yes, there was. No, go ahead. Wait, 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 you have to wait for this object. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. It's wonderful to hear. Please tell us your name. I'm Jean Lave, and I'm a professor emerita here at Berkeley, and I taught at Irvine for 23 years, and here for another 20. Grew up in a university all my life, university. And I'm deeply, deeply distressed, as we all are, about what's happening. Uh, I very much appreciated hearing your views, but I know there are other people in the room who have been, among other things, struggling deeply and practically to try and deal with the situation we find ourselves in. And I would hope, given how little time we have, that maybe some of them would also contribute. So rather than having a, 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 a questions to the panel, uh, uh, couldn't other people c mm -hmm. can contribute. I think that would be very helpful. And then maybe you guys could respond, but in, in many ways, rather than with more long discussion. Um, uh, so I guess I'll try and tell you what I think uh, a future university <laughs> might look like. I, 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 I both want to say that I, I think uh, it ought to be deeply and primarily educative first and that you can do the teaching of undergraduates, but you can do the teaching of graduate students, you can do working with postdocs. Uh, 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 it will be done in ways that are different from the corporate uh, uh, equivalents if the education is the bottom line and not profit. 
you make education the bottom line of the university, and uh, uh, the fight it would take to reinstate that as a principle is incredible because the neoliberal takeover of the administration of universities, turning them into profit centers, turning them into, uh, 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 turning students into uh, consumers, is all part of the uh, 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 taking away state funding uh, uh, and so on, uh, are, 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 and dividing the faculties and the students and the, what gets done in the university are all parts of the situation we face. If the fight to return to an educative bottom line for the university is one in which I think if faculty, students, and citizens of this state and, and so on don't start to struggle and fight and to be critical and to understand the jeopardy that we're all in, uh, uh, there's no hope. And I, I feel discouraged. I've sat in roomfuls of co-faculty and said, you know what, we're employees of the state. Uh, and uh, in negotiating our labor, our lives, our work, our students, what constitutes education, we aren't doing that with an administration who is, uh, shares the same views we do. We now are facing an enemy, uh, people who are inimical to what we're trying to do. That's a huge change in the university. I hate it. <laughs> uh, but it's true, and so I, someone was saying we need to do pedagogical courses for all our students. I think we need to do critical university analysis as part of the consciousness raising of every person on the university who participates in the university and to grow groups of people who will fight for changes that matter for us to make education what this place is about. Sorry, that's no, too much. thank you. Okay, I'm gonna give now our panel a chance to respond. Okay, Frank, I think Start, Starting with me, okay, yeah. so Mike's working, okay. Um, I, I got, I think, one answer to the last two questions. Um, I think administrators believe, and I think that they would wanna to try to convince faculty that if they don't have the, if they don't spend money on glittering student unions and recreation centers that have climbing walls, that they won't be able to compete for students with other universities. I think that's their rationale. And I do have an anecdote that shows you that this is really an age-old problem. Um, Thorstein Veblen, in his great book, The Higher Learning in America, um, which came out in 1916, um, devotes a whole chapter to why it's a horrible thing that universities spend so much on physical plant. And he has one hilarious anecdote in that chapter, which is, he doesn't mention the university, but it's Stanford, um, right across the bay. Um, in, I guess, 1906, Stanford built this state-of-the-art chemistry building, architectural marvel, looked absolutely perfect from the outside. Um, but they went on the cheap when it came to ventilating the building. Yeah. And so one after another, chemists were being poisoned. That didn't really seem to bother the university until it became such an epidemic problem and there was the risk that professors of chemistry might die of poisoning <laughs> that they installed a better ventilation system. They were more concerned with how the building looked than they were about the education that went on in it or even the health of the professors who were teaching. So I think that's a, a just evidence of how deeply entrenched this idea that um, extra educative missions have always been really important to universities. And I, think it'd be, I think it'll be a very hard problem to reverse. Uh, okay. Anybody else want to respond to yeah. the first? I'll yes, very, please. Very briefly. And then Kate. Uh, I mean, agree with Frank. On the other hand, there, the escalation um, in the construction of amenities over the last, say, 30 years, it makes, you know, Veblen's comment uh, almost irrelevant. So. On the other hand, it's very hard to go back on it. Now, let me just say that I think one of the most serious mistakes we made over the last 50 years, but particularly over the last 40 years, is in overbuilding. And that's everything. And that's a self-fulfilling prophecy, because once you've got all these buildings, you've got to heat them and maintain them. And in fact, you need to find people to use them in some way. So I think we've created a Frankenstein's monster. And I don't imagine mothballing the buildings, so I don't know what we do. Okay. Uh, I appreciated what you said about 
having people other than us speak because we've had our chance. So let me be as, as quick as possible. The growth in administration. Now, I've been a dean in two universities, as my friend John Gillis knows. And I, it's probably pure narcissism that makes me ask not to set up two blocks and make the administrators the them and the enemy, because it's not, it's not solid. It's not that monolithic. The growth of administration is in part, it's a double-edged in some ways. It's a growth in wellness, in health facilities. It's also a growth in legal staffs. And in part, it's a growth in legal staffs because of all the laws that have come in that we all supported. Affirmative action regulations, this, that, Americans for Disability Act, that all of these entailed the growth of a legal bureaucracy to make sure that the university was in compliance. So I, yes, I've seen the growth. I've seen the growth of centralization. But we also have to look at areas, because some of those areas have grown because they represent activities that we have fought for and hoped would happen. And the question of educative, and you know, Stan and I have had this disagreement for some time. The one reason why I like Carr's vision in the multiversity, and then he expresses his debt to William James, and William James's ideas of pluralism, is because there are lots of different things, but there's not a hierarchy. Lots of different things are important, depending upon what it does and who it serves. So I would hate to see a university that stripped itself of the words like discovery, creativity, and in fact, you, I had a new name for humanities too. I think yours is better, the greater humanities. Mine is creativity studies. But I think that in our, <laughs> in our help, in our urge to restore undergraduate education, we don't amputate the capacity for discovery and innovation and creativity. And I just wanted just to make a comment on your, uh, your comment about restoring the educative mission. Uh, and that faculty you know, would embrace that. Unfortunately, I see such dissension among faculty. I mean, there are clearly a whole group of faculty who are not interested in restoring the educative mission. Uh, these are the people who see the earners versus the welfare recipients. I mean, that is their perception of the campus. Uh, and we've had to teach people, I'm responsible for postdoctoral appointments at UCLA, and we've had to put together a document on mentoring. Because you know there were people who never saw their postdoc because that's the person who they paid cheaply to, you know, to carry out the labor. Uh, you know, mentoring wasn't even a part of their conception of their job. So you know, you, it, it, there's no unified faculty on this now, at least in major research universities. I would suggest. <laughs> I, I would like to suggest that we follow the lead of Robert Hutchins at the University mm. of Chicago and do away with all sports. These mm. budgets are bloated like the military budgets. And if you did away with that overnight, there would be massive infusions of funds and we could have intramural sports. And when, when Cal and Stanford get on the field, they could do debates rather than... <laughs> but that, that, those are budgets that are truly out of control. Anybody else here before we go back to our... OK, hands up. Barry. Sorry, we need the object. I have a... Uh, oh, I'm Barry Thorne. I'm an interpretive... Uh, humanistic sociologist. She's part of the greater humanities. Which <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm out there in the Bronx. <laughs> My heart's in Manhattan. Um, and I, I loved your vision, Jim. I'm just so on board for that. But I am also, I have a bumper sticker that reads, public need, not corporate greed. And every time I go to my car, but I do ride my bike most of the time, when I go to my car, I just keep thinking, that's the nub of the matter. It's, uh, it, it is such an tr obvious, uh, stupid tragedy that California is so wealthy. The amount of wealth in this state 
and that we have impoverished, we have a bankrupt government. What is that all about? And that we couldn't even pass Proposition 24 that would have re re uh, ended some of the special tax breaks for corporations. And I keep thinking about the students I teach, and I love the students here. They're the, the lack of a sense of entitlement, and I don't necessarily love that because there's too little sense of entitlement among you know, students from diverse backgrounds who are the first in their family to go to college. I don't fault them for not, but it's so different from the students I taught at Stanford about 10 years ago. And um, I keep wanting to make, help them feel more entitled to what they deserve which is that the public should be investing in them rather than them thinking their education is their own private investment. It, it's such a turnaround of thinking that has crept upon us that's now become the logic of the world around us that we somehow have to turn around politically and part of our educative job is to do that. I'm just commenting on how difficult it is to do that. Wendy, can I comment very quickly? I, just, I think that you may be doing what you need to do to do it. Because if you keep raising the tuition, my students at Princeton's feel entitled. <laughs> <laughs> David, if you'll tell us who you are. Uh, David Hollinger. I want to. I, I came in at five o'clock when I heard Jim Clifford's actually very inspiring speech. So I'm not sure what <clears throat> the rest of the conversation has been. But since one favorite idea of mine has not been voiced in the 45 minutes that I've been here, <laughs> I will voice it briefly. <clears throat> this is a topic that Stan Katz and um, Kate Stimson and I have been debating for about 20 years. I think that the future of the humanities in American universities depends deeply on a strong and consistent alliance with the sciences. And that we need to do a better job of stressing the Wissenschaftlicke aspects of what we do and talking about degrees of warrant. Now it's okay to use words like interpretation and creativity, but I fear that the humanities has undersold themselves by not stressing the extent to which the truth claims that we advance in our books and articles and in our classes are deeply warranted. We haven't absorbed the uh, language of science to the extent that I think we have a right to do. I think our research has actually put us in a very strong position to do that, yet there is a strain of ambivalence about professionalism and about consensus in the humanities culture and academia, which has made it difficult for us to unite around a more Wissenschaftliche language. Too often we associate ourselves with the arts. That's a bad political mistake. The arts have their own justification. It works very well. They have a lot of donors that are interested in them. Future of the humanities, I think, depends on making ourselves look uh, as much like the sciences as we are. I'm not asking us to pretend to be something that we're not. I don't think we present ourselves as sufficiently Wissenschaft. Like, I don't know whether Stan and, and, and Kate have come around on that issue through the year. <laughs> All right, there's a lot to throw on fire in the last 10 minutes. Wendy, can I, I'll, yes, say, we'll very, I'll, be, I'll be very quick. Okay, so I'm going to invite you to respond to, to Barry and to David. Okay, just wish. very quickly, but okay. um, somebody did mention that before, David, before you came in. Uh, I agree, I'm entirely on, on board. I think it's very important. I think the problem, actually, and we could talk about this over drinks later, is not the sciences, it's the social sciences which I think have a faux scientific orientation these days and are dis destroying what is best and most socially useful in the social sciences. And I think that makes our job more difficult. I'm not allowed to say this because I'm moderating, but I'm just going to say as one of those social, sciences, uh, social scientists, I completely agree. That is the, the sciences mostly know better. They actually are reflective and reflexive about um, paradigms, interpretations, even discourses that are constituting their field of study. And the social sciences are still in another orbit of, and want to be, you know, want to be are always more conservative. Right. Well, it depends. It depends. Hey. And, and here I think uh, Jim was very helpful because he saw roads in, across the disciplines with the notion of the greater humanities. So that I think, again, we can't overly generalize about any of the social sciences. David, I didn't know we, we really disagreed so much. 
But I've been thinking about the quadrivium. Mm -hmm. And the quadrivium did represent the mathematical sciences. And the older notions of the liberal arts, which are not to be dismissed and despised, the older notions of the liberal arts had the humanities and the sciences working together with the trivium and the quadrivium. And I think what we've done is we've broken that conceptual and pedagogical unity and put the humanities there and then the sciences there. And I, I, I happened to run, when I was a dean, a, a faculty dining group drawn from across the university, including medicine and law. The humus, I have to say, with all due respect and love, the humanists were paranoid. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I should come, said the chair of a leading department. Are the scientists going to make fun of me? Mm -hmm. It was the scientists who had much more curiosity mm -hmm. in some of the social sciences about what was going on. Perhaps it was the curiosity of confidence. <laughs> but, but, but nevertheless, I mean, the humanists who made that, that remark, he has tenure, he has a good salary, he has university housing, he has publications. What's he got to complain about? In a minute, we're going to ask Jim to respond to that, too, since he started it. But he's not ready. Well, I, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Wissenschaftlich. Um, if we could um, open a conversation around that, the translation of that term with the scientists, that would be pretty interesting. Uh, you know, this is a more, actually a more interpretive and historical notion of science. It's what Marx meant when he called for scientific socialism. Uh, there are, there I'm sh are, I'm sure, scientists, practicing scientists, um, who, in a discussion, would sign on to that definition. But they won't put it in their grant application. I can promise you that. And um, so I guess my feeling is um, it, it's good to think about conversations with the scientists, and it's good to think about you know trying to look like them if, to the extent we can do it without selling our souls. Levi Strauss was very was smart. He when he got his chair at the Collège de France, which is you know as you know the Collège is a kind of an anarchist institution really that was about finding geniuses and letting them invent their chairs. Levi Strauss called his the Laboratoire d'Anthropologie Sociale, <laughs> and he ended up by the time he was done supporting like about sixty researchers, and as a result, he made common cause with the natural scientists at the Collège, who had laboratories that they didn't want to close down when the next genius was found, and so he was able to actually manage his succession, which is very totally against the tradition of the Collège. I mention this as an. Ex as a successful attempt uh, to appropriate scientific rhetoric. But I, I, I'm skeptical. Uh, I guess I, my notion of two cultures and, and a notion that there was a kind of, that there really is a real and fundamental antagonism between the stems and the rest, and I was trying to find names for the rest, you know, for something that we could call it. The sense that there is a, a real structural antagonism there I guess I would stand by my own r r realist <laughs> claim there, that that is actually um, a fact, of a, a social fact and a political and economic fact that really can't be, um, really can't be corrected by you know, ha having good conversations with the scientists who might be willing to reflect on the history and practice of science, um, but who still have to get their grants and and conform to what is, what is a pretty positivistic uh, model of science. So that is a narrow, instrumental, empirical in the most narrow sense um, vision. And uh, I do think there's a real antagonism here. That uh, and and I don't think we will enter into. <coughs> conversations that will lead to something like empowerment until we claim more power somehow. We can't do it uh, 
in, in, in personalized or, or opportunistic ways. And I, and I also think that, you know, you say, yeah, okay, let's make ourselves, I'm, I'm absolutely all for um, making strong truth claims the way historians can do it. And I think most people understand that historian, the claims of truth of a historian, let's say, or an anthropologist, really can't be judged in the same way with the same degree of um, testing and predictability that might be the case in, in, in uh, physics, certain, certain elements of physics anyway, or you know, the hard, the, the hard sciences. We should do that. And that's why, for example, I use the word realism, and I, and I want to contest for that term, and not leave it to the analytic philosophers and the scientists. It's been hung up between them and the literary critics and I want to uh, reclaim a space in between. That's the space of the Wissenschaftlich, in my view. So that's a conversation. But I, I'm worried about trying to look like scientists. Uh, I, I really think it's, it won't win for us. I think what will win is if we can somehow, somehow, describe, redescribe what we do in non-paranoid ways that um, make serious claims for the representation of reality. You know, a phrase from Eric Auerbach, <laughs> the representation of reality, uh, make serious claims for those, and, and then do whatever we have to do in terms of persuasion, image mongering to a degree, uh, the, the pipeline idea, you know, that you, Bill mentioned, you know, saying how our research leads to teaching, which then leads to certain forms of dissemination, which then actually reaches people in ways that are meaningful to them. All of that is good, and all of that we can do without claiming to be scientists. I really, or, or anything like natural scientists, and I agree with everyone who said that the social sciences, who tried to be like, a, a rather impoverished and naive view of natural science <laughs> have, um, have really shot themselves in the foot. Shot us in the foot. Okay. Us in the foot. Uh, anyway, uh, blah, blah. So that's just some shooting. reaction. Sorry. Um, I think oh. it, it was called, in psychology, when I was in, the, in graduate school, they called it physics envy. Remember yeah, right. the Freudian term. But anyway, <laughs> there is. Why was the envy now? Right. <laughs> There is an area, I think, in science, though, where it is essential that we have more input from the humanities. Uh, right now, both NSF and NIH are requiring that we provide training for all investigators, all trainees in what's called RCRs, Responsible Conduct of Research. And that is because there has been irresponsible conduct of research. And fundamentally, we're talking about ethics. You know, we're talking about history. I mean, we're talking about uh, issues that are central to the humanities. Uh, at the same meeting I was at uh, last week of the American uh, Association of Medical Colleges, uh, we learned that the standard mechanisms for teaching RCRs in medical schools, it turns out not only don't work, somebody did a meta-analysis of it, where you look at all the literature, not only don't they work, they make the problem worse. People learn how to cheat. <laughs> so you can't use the strategies that the scientists have been using. You've got to rethink this problem. And now this is a mandate as of last July, I mean, January 1. And it seems to me this is the perfect opportunity, and certainly I'm going to propose it on my campus, for these sides of campus to get together where it is essential that people get together. Uh, and, and think about you know, ethics and research in, in a new kind of way. All right, we have several hands up. I'm gonna let Kate have a no, minute. No, I, I can hold you can hold it? Yeah. Okay, and then we're gonna go back out here. I, we're, we're going here first, sorry. I'm Louise Fortman uh, from the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management, and the university I am for is interdisciplinary and participatory. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Louise should be a model for the brevity of comments at this point in yeah. the <laughs> evening, so that's to you. <laughs> um, my name is William Runyon. I've 
been a professor at Berkeley for 31 years and just retiring in the School of Social Welfare and affiliate in the psychology department. One way that seems useful to me to relate science and humanities is in the history of science. I work particularly in the history and biography of the social sciences. That's one way that people care about. I co-edited a book, The History of Psychology and Autobiography, with Gardner Lindsay before he died, and that has autobiographies by the most eminent psychologist in the United States or the world. It's a, a kind of thing that scientists can relate to. Oh my God, what did they do? What did they do right? What did they get wrong? My one question is, I gave a talk yesterday to our doctoral students, and I, I told them, I think each of you, there are two books I think you ought to read if you're planning to be in academia. You know, one is Jonathan Coles, the, the, the Great American University, mm -hmm. and the other was Louis Menand's The Marketplace of Ideas. And the question, was that bad advice to give them? Is there other stuff they should be reading? Should they not be reading those things? <laughs> well, no matter how you define, oh, I'm Mike Thaler, and I'm Professor Emeritus uh, from UCSF, and I'm visiting history professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz, and at the moment I teach medical ethics at UCSF. Ah. Uh, I just want to make a very brief comment, and I will be true to my word, um, and that is a one, a one uh, aspect of this discussion that I think is missing is the role of society in the university. Uh, and in fact, Clark Kirk's vision, of course, was based on the idea of the corporate university, of the idea of the university becoming part of the greater world and serving the greater world as well as being influenced by it. And since we're undergoing sea changes in the outer world, largely driven by science and technology, I might say, uh, which might also account for the growth of administration, because if you also look into who these administrators are, they, they're also IT people and systems people and so on. And so the one place where, no matter how you look at the two cultures or whatever you call it, science, humanities, where they are joined at the hip is medicine. They just simply cannot exist without each other, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. and, and so what is happening uh, to medicine in the greater context, in the larger society, uh, is a lens. Uh, into the problems that, that the university here, the humanities aspects anyway, are facing. So I think that one cannot come up with any kind of rationale for the future university without really understanding what is driving society at, at large. And that's just a generous uh, sweep. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Just before we go back here, I'll take any last. All right. Uh, David? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to put something on the table that hasn't really been raised. It's interesting how um, the, the index is to the sciences, even on the part of the humanities. Uh, and I want to turn or, or ask about turning that around just for a moment. Um, in, in the spirit of the post Manhattan humanities, <laughs> if you might call it, um, there's a sense in which. Um, none of the large scientific problems uh, that the sciences take to be addressing uh, and to be resolving in some sense or another are actually resolvable without human beings at the center of them. And the human is at the center, of course, also of the humanities. So this is, there's a sense in which an argue, a more robust argument, I think, needs to be made about how the humanities are at the center of the sciences and ought in the problem-solving um, reach of the sciences in that kind of instrumentality uh, that, 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 that not just the human but the humanities need to be at the table. I mean, you know, how do you solve the problem of delivery of water in the state of California without talking about human beings? I just don't get it, right? And, and when, you, when you flip it in that kind of way, it, it provides one with a different kind of disposition, I think, to think about how you approach the, uh, in problem-solving kinds of ways uh, the, the kinds of issues that the sciences themselves face. So um, it's 6 o'clock. And what I want to just see is if anyone from our panel, since many of our panels have come from thousands of miles away, it's time to give them the last word if they wish. If any of you wish to say something at this point, as opposed to just be applauded. 
Yeah, I, I actually, Kate, Kate will say something. You don't mind. I got on a plane in New York at 6.50 this morning so I could be here. So I would like to take a penultimate exactly. word if you don't want. Um, the question of ethics, yes, because this is not simply a scientific problem. Within humanities and social science, the question of plagiarism is absolutely haunting. Mm -hmm. And our electronic technologies, as we all know, only make that too easy. But a source of unity, not a false unity, but a genuine unity among the disciplines and interdisciplines and transdisciplines is certainly the idea of the university itself and the existence and continuation of an idea that people share. And it seems to me, especially as the great public institutions are under such attack, there must be an alliance, a deep political and psychological alliance among the administrators and the faculty and the students that care about the university itself as a site of teaching and discovery. Mm -hmm. 